Yeah, I actually uh, probably have enough material to do a four hour talk. <laughs> Not that y'all would be interested in hearing a four hour talk. So, uh, but I did pare it back to 45 minutes. We'll have to make do with that. All right. Can you hear me okay? The volume good? Uh, I like to talk loud anyway. Uh, so as you could tell, we had some technical difficulties. That includes the pointer, the clicker not working. So I'm gonna stand here and then walk over there and then come back and we'll just do our best. So uh, last summer, um, we were having discussions internally just about, um, just amongst ourselves about the history of the Arboretum. And this whole thing got sparked. Uh, Mark and I were talking about, I wonder what happened here before there was an Arboretum. Uh, of course, the Arboretum was founded in 76. And uh, Mark says, well, I have a little thing that's cool. I have the deed for the property when NC State bought this property. And that was from 36. So um, I, I'm just enough of a nerd. And I said, yeah, I'd love to read that whole deed. And I did. Uh, and so that was one part of this. And that's going to be kind of part one of this talk. Uh, and then part two is going to be, um, uh, I then emailed the North Carolina State University History Department. And I said, you know, hey, History Department, do you have anybody who knows about Raleigh history, especially about the land around um, the Arboretum, and I told them where the Arboretum was and stuff. And they said, no, but uh, here's a couple of hyperlinks, and that really lit the fire. Um, and they sent me to, they sent me two articles um, where some properties that adjoin the Arboretum, butt up right against it, were um, uh, part of the National Register of Historic Places. And of course, they're long articles and they all have hyperlinks. And so I just, I've, I've been up to two and three in the morning, many, many nights, just enjoying myself. And I'm gonna share a little bit of that with you tonight. Not, not four hours worth, 45 minutes worth, I hope. Okay, so to tonight we're gonna talk about the history of the Arboretum before it was an Arboretum. Oh, there it is, okay, a little delay. Okay. So most of you here are well familiar with the Arboretum. I, I made this first slide just for a few people um, who might not be as familiar with the Arboretum. Uh, we are a 10 acre garden, uh, public garden, we're open to the public, and we can um, conduct education programs for children, for students, college students, high school students, and adults. Uh, and um, our mission here is to promote and trial new and interesting plants for the landscape. Uh, that was JC's main goal uh, when he started in 76. Uh, garden centers typically only had about 40 plants, and he wanted to increase that. Okay, we are part of North Carolina State University, and we are part of their agricultural research laboratories. And that uh, plays a lot into what we're going to talk about tonight. So um, before we get into the history I'm going to talk about, um, there are uh, lots of our history has been written down quite well. Um, uh, uh, Bobby Ward, who's here tonight, wrote a book a few years ago, and I think we have some for sale. Um, and it covers, it's a biography of J.C. Ralston. And so it goes, probably the last third of it or so is about his time here at the Arboretum and his struggles getting started and his uh, laser focus of uh, building the place and all that. And, and of course, J.C. passed away in 1996. Um, and uh, that history is well covered here. Our history, all of it, from 76 all the way today, is also covered in, in bits and pieces in our biannual newsletter and our email updates and all that kind of stuff too. So we, we have that. Uh, we have another person in the audience tonight, I'm not gonna mention her in case she wants to stay private, who is thinking about writing another book covering this uh, kind of second part of our history. And of course, what I am gonna talk about tonight is the third part so we can have a trilogy. Everybody <laughs> likes trilogies, right? So um, uh, part, the third part of our history of uh, where I'm gonna start my talk tonight is uh, 36 when uh, the Arboretum was, or the land that the Arboretum was on was purchased by NC State uh, and they called it the Agricultural Experiment Station among other things. And, uh, and then I'm gonna talk about deep history. We're gonna go back <laughs> all the way to just after the Civil War into the Re Reconstruction era, and then move forward from there and talk about 
our connections to our historically important neighbors and, um, and, and some just unknown things. Actually, I found out some really cool stuff and, uh, about that era. Um, and that, this is where I spent most of my time because I didn't know this part of Raleigh history and there's tons of digital archives out there with beautiful photos and great stories. I encourage everyone to go and uh, dig deep one night into this stuff. I'm going to be using a lot of maps to tell our story. Um, and I know some people have trouble reading maps, but this is the Arboretum. This is north. Barrel Road is our northern border. We're kind of bordered on the east by the Beltline. Um, and uh, right, over the, right over Barrel Road are the train tracks, which have a, if I have enough time, I'm going to do a little train history for, the, for you train buffs. And then on the other side of that is Hillsborough Street. Uh, and then the other side of that is the uh, vet school and, um, and on and on up. All right, so I said we are part of the, um, an agricultural research lab, uh, and it's also called an agricultural experiment station. And what is one of those? Well, so NC State was founded in, in 1887 uh, as a land-grant college, and its main purpose was to do agricultural research for the benefit of rural uh, North Carolinians. Okay, this was an era where if you lived in the country, you were really poor, really uneducated, and didn't. And there was some science that was starting to come on board during this era that wasn't getting out to the public. Um, and so, uh, um, uh, when NC State was founded, they were doing initially doing study on agricultural crops, row crops, corn, tobacco, stuff like that, horticultural crops, which are a little bit different. Um, apple orchards and vineyards and, and things that don't, that you can't run a tractor through and harvest, um, as well as livestock. And um, later on, uh, they added ornamental plants, which is of course our focus here. Um, once people um, started realizing you could make money growing ornamental plants, uh, we started, uh, the NC State started researching them to help the farmers out doing that. So, um, there are 18 main agricultural research stations around the state. These are run in conjunction with three organizations, the uh, uh, North Carolina Department of Agriculture, NC State, and North Carolina a and NC State owns some of this land, a and owns some of it, NCDA owns some of it, but they all run these 18 stations uh, jointly. Now, in addition to that, NC State locally owns some land that just they own, and um, that is where we fit in. Uh, we are one of NC State's local properties that um, also contribute to agricultural research. Um, Shank Forest, just southeast of um, Umstead Park, is for the forestry department. The vet school today is doing veterinary medicine, but before that, before there was a vet school, that's where they did livestock studies. Um, um, the J.C. Ralston Arboretum, just south of there, and we are actually part of an organization called the Horticultural Field Lab. That's one of our titles. Uh, and so you will hear me say HFL quite a bit tonight, and that's what I mean is the Horticultural Field Lab, which, is, which we are a part of. NC State also has a huge property, like 1,500 acres, down south of the Beltline and north of Lake Wheeler, along Lake Wheeler Road, uh, where um, they do everything. They do livestock, they do plants, they do agroecology, composting, uh, everything you can think of, erosion control, all kinds of agricultural research goes on down there. Ice cream. I'm sorry, what? Ice cream. Yes, they do ice cream. That's where Howling Cow is. Uh, and and they, they actually they grow the food there, feed it to the cows there, harvest the milk there, and they, it's soup to nuts or ice to cream. All right, so, but for this talk tonight, we're talking about the history of this land that we're sitting on right now. Um, and so I dug up a, a, a deed from um, the Wake County GIS system. This is the lot of land that we are on. NC State owns everything here that's in the red. Um, and the Arboretum here is that little bit at the uh, top, which is uh, the green right along Barrow Road. Uh, the yellow, uh, the two thirds, the next two thirds unit is um, the horticultural field lab. That's everything that's that way that uh, we don't let you see. <laughs> it's mostly greenhouses. Uh, it um, would be pretty boring if you got back there. Um, and then uh, NC State, the land goes almost down to the old Kmart, if you remember the old Kmart. Anyone remember the old Kmart? All right, that's there. Uh, and it goes almost down to there. But this is other um, 
departments outside of horticulture. There's entomology. There's a, a warehouse. There's other stuff down there. I want you to notice this little keyhole right here. This is one of the National Register of Historic Places property um, that is literally almost engulfed by um, NC State. And this is the other one we're gonna talk about method right across the highway from us. So like I said, we are um, called now the Horticultural Field Lab, HFL. But if you're looking in old documentation, uh, we are also Note, noted as the North Carolina Agricultural Experiment Station, Farm Unit Number Four. I presume there's a one, two, and three somewhere. Uh, method Farm and Method Station, and then if you go way back, we're the Raleigh Farm. So, how do we know what was going on here before 1976? How did I figure it out? Well, uh, I did everything I could. I talked to some. Um, people who were, are still around today and still coming around the Arboretum who were here before 76. I talked to uh, the former department head, uh, Tom Anako. I had a nice conversation with him. In the back, we have Bernadette, who wasn't working here back then, but as a little girl, her father, who was working here back then, would bring her out to this property to collect bugs. He was an entomologist. Um, a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to go over to Method, um, the neighborhood that's right across the uh, highway, and um, talk to some of those folks. And they are all, the, the folks that I talked to, they're all in their 70s now, but they were teenagers and kids in the 50s and 60s before we were an Arboretum and before, um, and, and they have some nice stories about coming, before we put a fence up, they'd come over here and play on the property. Um, we were doing fruit research back then and the uh, spoken agreement was if the fruit fell on the ground, the method kids can come pick it up and take it home and eat it. And they did for a long time uh, until some of the entrepreneurial ones tried to sell it on the street. And that's illegal because of the laws of NC State and how we operate. And so we had to shut that down. But uh, We have written in photo, uh, photographic records and we're gonna see lots of old photos that I've dug up from a bunch of different sources, uh, really cool photos. And we also have a lot of cooperative extension materials. So um, NC State is the research arm doing all the raw research. Cooperative extension is a state group that works with NC State to um, package all that information up in a way that it's, uh, the public can consume. Videos, pamphlets, uh, presentations, stuff like that. This particular photo here, if you are out Bernadette and I were talking about this. Uh, if you were out just east of here, standing in what's probably the White Garden or around there, and face due south, which is that way, um, you would be looking over a grove of apricots. Uh, Tom Anaka was telling me that they did evaluation of fruit trees to uh, especially apricots. They're trying to breed varieties that um, flowered later so the flowers wouldn't get nipped by a late winter freeze. And we're looking, um, this is some of the greenhouses that were on the HFL back then. And this is, um, if you come in through the back way, which a few of you have done, there's a building you pass called the Deerstein Building. So we're looking back at the Deerstein Building. This is from 1976, so the year that the Arboretum opened up. Okay, one of the other things we do here, we do, we do here now, this is actually Bernadette's, one of her jobs, uh, and we've been doing this since at least the early 60s, is we have been trialing annuals. Uh, we conduct something called the All-America Selection Annual Trials. Uh, seed companies send us their newest and greatest, the best new petunia you've ever seen, and the best new this and that, uh, all annuals, and we plant them out, and uh, at the end of the summer, Bernadette and her predecessors wrote a report to send back to the seed companies. They're doing these trials all over the US and when they want to find out the seed companies if a plant's going to do well all over the US or if it's going to do great in Washington and terrible in North Carolina. They want to know that. So here's some photos. The one on the left is from February of 75, so the year before we started up. That's the winter time so there's no trials going on. And this is the, um, the following year. Uh, when It's in June though so you can see the flowers. You can also see the old old Lath House. Uh, we have a nice new one, which I don't know how old it is, but that one looks like it's falling down even then. Uh, Tim, I think he was around when 
when uh, the new FBI house went up. So we were also doing woody plant um, breeding and evaluations. Um, this is one particular professor, Dr. Fred Cochran, who worked here at the um, NC State from the 40s until the late 70s. Um, and if you guys, when you guys came in, you parked in, the, hopefully most of you parked in the parking lot. This is the parking lot. At least this is what it looked like back in 1975, before we were in Arboretum. Fred Cochran was doing azalea breeding and azalea trials. Um, this azalea here is named Dr. Fred Cochran, um, and he bred it. He is also uh, looking at camellias and other woody plants. Uh, this is looking northeast, and in the background you can see the water tower that's up by the vet school and the fairgrounds. And that road there, that's Barrel Road. Okay, we go back even a little further. These pictures are from the 50s and 60s. There's the Laugh House again. Um, we also did, in addition to um, plant breeding, we did woody plant and, and other ornamental plant trials. Uh, here is a picture of the Laugh House, as I mentioned, uh, from 62. This is, we used to do All America Rose Trials. Uh, we had a big rose garden here. Uh, and that's from, that picture's from 57. Uh, we did, uh, Food crops, at least the horticultural food crops, were done here as well. Uh, here's a whole list of the fruits, some of the fruits that the method kids were coming over and, and taking off the ground, uh, and, and some of the vegetables that would have been studied here. Um, now, we didn't grow the pickles already dilled. Um, <laughs> we, uh, uh, we grew the cucumbers and they dilled them elsewhere. But um, there's this annual report that there's, um, starting in like 18... 89 or something, and going all the way to the 70s, I could find these online digitized. And they discuss the, um, mostly the food research that was going on here, um, but uh, um, a little bit the ornamental as well. I mentioned cooperative extension, and their job is to wrap up this research and put it out in a consumer-friendly way. Um, who here has ever seen the TV show Almanac Gardener? It's on PBS, it runs once a week. It's been going for like 33 years. Um, that, this, that show had a predecessor, which is called Aspect. Does anyone here remember Aspect? No? Bernadette does. <laughs> Actually, her father uh, was on it, so she remembers it because she would go to the studio and sit with her father and wait for him to be finished. But anyway, so they did one episode here. They're, these two fellows are standing out in... Um, probably close to where we're sitting right now. That's where the Rose Garden was. And you can see, this is a, TV, a half hour TV show and they're out there, doing. he's doing an interview uh, and talking about all the stuff that is grown here. Um, I actually have this queued up and we can play it, but we're not gonna play it right now. I'm, I'm a little bit worried about time because um, I, like I said, I did a really deep dive and I wanna make sure I get everything in. But it's a, really, it's a really funny show. So um, on the left, John Harris uh, is this really, really thin man, is a um, cooperative extension agent, and he was the interviewee. And the guy on the right, Hal Reynolds, was the host of the show. All right. Who remembers the farmhouse? I'm about... 25% of you, 30% of you. So um, that was one of the rabbit holes I went down. I was trying to find out what's the deal with this farmhouse, okay? Uh, so it was torn down in 2007, all right, a, a few years after this building was completed. Um, uh, it was, uh, the top floor was an apartment where a grad student or a employee of um, NC State would live uh, to manage the property from at night and stuff. Uh, downstairs, there was an office, the, this employee's uh, daily office, and a classroom where they, Arbor Eden would hold its early classes, and around back with some storage. So um, I could not, I, like I said, Mark had the deed, and I read the deed. It mentioned nothing about a building passing to us when we bought the land. Uh, so that was 36. We know the farmhouse wasn't there in 36, or we can strongly suggest. But I did also find that the USDA has these really high-res aerial photos of all of Wake County. They were doing topographic and soil studies. Um, and I found this from 1938, and there's the house. Um, uh, or, that could be the Chinese weather balloon photo, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but uh, you can also see um, there is no belt line here. We're going to talk a little bit about when that went in. But what you can also see, this is Method Road, and this is uh, the Method uh, 
the Ariel Kelly School that we're going to be talking about in a bit. All right, so I, uh, this whole thing started, as I mentioned, Mark had a deed, and I was just nerdy enough to read the whole thing and actually read a whole bunch more because one deed leads to one good deed leads you to another. Uh, I'm on fire tonight. Is this thing on? Um, so uh, this deed, and you can actually look up, these were hyperlinks and they, they do work. I'm gonna share this slide package with y'all. Um, and uh, you can go and look up your own deed or you can look up these old deeds if you want. But uh, we purchased the land in April of 36 from some investment corporation. Uh, the land had been floating around for a while for $10, okay, $10. Now the next line said, plus other considerations. And I was, I was like, Wait, what does that mean? Were we dealing something on the side? Mark and I were talking about this and we think what was happening is, during this period of time, NC State was buying lots of property. The, the uh, campus was growing very rapidly. And so we probably we think that $10 was the cost of the paperwork. And the considerations was we swapped one lot of land we didn't want for a lot of land that we did, did want. Reading on in the deed, it gets even funnier. Uh, um, lots of legalese, party of the first part, party of the second part, stuff like that. Um, but there's also, you know, these deeds will come with a plat, a, a drawn out map, but they also will have a long written description of the lot. And it's really funny. It says, it says start at the railroad tracks near, across from Camp Mangum. Does anyone know what Camp Mangum is? Okay. I, one person knows. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if I have time, I'm going to tell you about Camp Mangum. Um, but by 1936, when this deed was written, even Camp Mangum was long gone. So why is that being mentioned? Um, walk south along the Burial Kelly property until you come to a stone. Turn, walk until you come to a pipe. Turn again, walk till you come to another pipe. Turn, walk till you come to a grate. And it just continues on until you've done this uh, perimeter around the property. It's just hilarious. Um, and uh, um, so I mentioned that one deed leads to another. Um, at the end of the deed, it says the person we bought it from, the deed when they bought it was registered and it's written there. So you can follow from deed to deed um, all the way back to the beginning. You can see this first one's handwritten. Uh, and here are the approximate dates of people who owned this land and when they owned it. I've underlined two. Uh, we're going to talk about Barry O'Kelly. He's very important um, and part of the method community. Um, and I underlined another one. Who knows who Pullen is? Just a few. Yeah, everyone. Pullen Park. It's that guy. Okay, so he. So we have two kind of historically interesting people who um, owned this property. Barry O'Kelly owned this property for 25 years. Uh, I'm not sure what he was doing with it. He certainly didn't develop it. Um, perhaps he was... Um, leasing it out to be farmed or something like that. So that concludes that. Now we're back to 36. So that concludes that first part. We're going to jump back and do the 1800s to up to 36. Um, so like I said, they sent me two links to these um, National Register of Historic Places, the cemetery, which all of us staff people drive by every morning when we come in because we all come in the back way. Uh, and the um, Method School, the Barry O'Kelly School. In today, it's called the Method Community Park. It's part of the Raleigh Parks and Recreation. And there's pickleball courts and a gym and stuff like that. You play pickleball there? Yeah, my, my intern plays pickleball there too. Maybe you've played against him. Um, so uh, let's talk about Method, okay? All right, we're going to go all the way back to the Civil War here. And... Uh, um, after the Civil War, you know, millions of slaves were freed, and many of them just picked up and left whatever farm or plantation they were working on to go start a new life somewhere else. And thousands and thousands of them decided they would come to Raleigh. Now, when I say thousands and thousands, that doesn't sound like a lot, except the population of Raleigh at that time was just 4,700 people. Raleigh was really small for a really long time before it started growing. Okay, so this is the border of Raleigh right now, or back then, not right now. Right now it goes to the moon. Um, and you can see there's Raleigh. You could fit a whole nother Raleigh and then some before you get out to where we are today, 
um, method road. All right, um, I circled it, but you can always find on these old maps where we are and where method community is. You follow, Hillsborough Street was one of the only streets leading west out of the town. You follow it till it jogs across the train tracks. The train tracks were there during um, the Civil War and uh, uh, so was Barrel Road, although back then that was Hillsborough Street. Barrel Road today was Hillsborough Street. Okay, it wasn't until the 20s that the straight Hillsborough Street that we know now was built. So Raleigh, the population of Raleigh swelled from right before the Civil War, 4,700 to um, uh, almost 8,000 right after the Civil War. So thousands and thousands of freedmen were coming here and they were, a lot of them decided to set up villages just for freedmen um, around Raleigh. Most of those villages were right around the outer edge, most in the south and east, but um, two in particular, everyone here, Oberlin, right? Um, that's, a, that's probably the most famous uh, Freedman's Village. And then Method, which isn't noted on this map just yet, uh, formed out. Now, it was probably uh, good that Oberlin and Method formed so far out of town because they're the only two that are left today. Um, all the others, as Raleigh has grown, have been swallowed up. Um, either just, they kind of just dissolved as more people just moved in around them or um, the people who bought land there sold it and it kind of got sold away. Sometimes it's eminent domain. We need to widen Western Boulevard or Wilmington Street or Capitol Boulevard or, or something. And uh, eminent domain was used to um, gobble these things up. But the only two that are left today are Method and Oberlin. <clears throat> uh, so now my second rabbit hole was <laughs> learning about Method. Um, and this was really cool. So um, in... 1872, this fellow here, who was a Civil War general of all things, um, sold 60 acres, 65 acres, to two half-brothers, Isaac O'Kelly and Jesse Mason. And Isaac O'Kelly and Jesse Mason uh, were the two fellows who started up this whole method community. And they subdivided the property and um, started selling small lots to freedmen as they came into method. And um, that's how method was born. This southern border, there's actually a creek here. If you walk down to main campus, there's a creek along Sullivan Drive called Rocky Branch. Um, that's the southern border. The northern border is the train tracks. This very northeast corner, anyone notes here? We all like to eat lunch there. Neomande. Neomande is the big, the, the northeast corner of the original method village. Uh, this is all heavily wooded, so they would cut down the trees and make these uh, log cabins and live there. Um, I even found the deed for this sale, and it's, the details are there. Um, this is Method today, bounded by uh, what's uh, Gorman Street, the train tracks, and the Beltline, and Ligon Street. Um, so a lot bigger and a little bit west of where it first started. Um, this uh, photograph is one of these USDA high-res photos. This particular one's from 1959. Uh, you can download these files, they're huge, and you can zoom way in um, and get a remarkable detail uh, on them. Um, all right, so Method Community uh, started in 1872. Um, the person we're going to talk about next who had such a big impact on us is Barry O'Kelly, and he moved to Method from Chapel Hill as a kid. He was orphaned. Um, and his relatives um, brought him here and raised him here. Uh, an incredible businessman. I wish I had this guy's resume, it's really amazing. Um, so he started working, there was a general store up on, any of you come in the way where you turned at the Waffle House, um, and then you pass the post office, right where that post office is today, there was a general store back then. And he started working there, then a few years later, bought a partial interest in it, and a few years after that, bought the whole thing. I don't know how he did, it was incredible. I couldn't, I couldn't buy this place after working here for a few years, <laughs> for sure. So, um, and throughout his life, he just he used his business acumen. He was involved with tons and tons and tons of businesses. Probably the, most, the ones that you see most frequently are the Raleigh Shoe Company um, and um, the Raleigh Independent Newspaper. Um, and 
he, um, there was a bank that formed in Durham uh, to serve uh, black people, and it was called the um, Mechanics and Farmers Bank. And he convinced them to open a branch in downtown Raleigh, and uh, they made him vice president and manager. By the way, he was doing all this at the same time. He didn't quit one job and go to the next. He had a lot of side gigs, okay? And um, so the mechan all, all these businesses are gone today except for the Mechanics and Farmers Bank, which is still there today in its original location on Hargett Street, still making small business loans to black people. So um, in addition to uh, doing business, he was involved with education. He was made trustee of Kittrell College. Kittrell College is a, uh, it's not closed, but it's an HBCU uh, out in Vance County back then, 100 years ago. Um, he was the president of the Negro State Fair. Uh, the State Fair used to be segregated and they would have the state fair, and then it would shut down, and then afterwards they would have the Negro State Fair. And all Barry O'Kelly did not condone segregation. He didn't want it at all. Um, he did want to um, educate black people, and so he um, was president of the Negro State Fair for a while. And he was a Sunday school teacher, and he was also, he didn't hold any political office, but he had a lot of political power, and uh, I have a couple stories related to that, if we have time later. <laughs> Here is the, uh, uh, he named it eventually, the Barry O'Kelly General Store. And this is the 1920s, that's Barry O'Kelly standing by it. And um, this is Barrel Road, and here's the general store. This is 64, the year it was torn down. And that's the post office being constructed right behind it. So um, I, go, I have to go to that post office for work every now and then. So I, you know, I drive by that thing every day, it's really cool. Uh, there is the, uh, Mechanics and Farmers Bank. It's been facelifted since then. Uh, there's a, a, a couple other photos from the era. Um, a, a receipt from his shoe store. Someone bought some shoes. And um, back before there was Yellow Pages, even before most people had phones, um, there were still, uh, they called them city directories. And they would have, they wouldn't have your phone number necessarily, but they would have if you lived inside the Raleigh limits, which were small, they would have your name and, and address. And if you had a business in Raleigh, they would list you also. Now, Barry O'Kelly lived way out in Method, um, but he owned a bunch of businesses in town. And in 1921, at least, they listed him as the owner of the shoe company and the president of the North Carolina Industrial Association. That is the, um, that's the Negro State Fair, the organization that runs it, ran it. Now, phone books even back then were segregated. What do you suppose that star means? Star means colored person. And um, later on, they switched it from being a star, an asterisk, to a letter C. But you can, always, um, you can always tell who was black and who was not black. All right, so he was a very, very strong supporter of educated, education for black children. And there was a small school formed in Method right after the Civil War. And he um, took it on and gave it a lot of money over the years, a lot of land when he was getting into real estate and buying land. Um, and a lot of his uh, fundraising efforts went towards the school too. Uh, so in 1895, they ended up renaming the school for him, the Barry O'Kelly School. And it went by several names over the years. Um, I, I listed there the Barry O'Kelly Training School uh, my grandmother went to training school. Uh, if you were a woman and you wanted to become a teacher, you'd go to training school. Um, it wasn't quite college, but you would come out of it and go teach elementary school somewhere. Okay, it was also known as the industrial school. If you were a young man and you wanted to learn carpentry or some trade, you could go to the Barry O'Kelly School. Okay. Uh, and this picture in the upper right, I took that a few weeks ago, that there's only two buildings remaining. At its peak, it had eight buildings. Um, but today, all that's left is the agriculture building and the gym. All right, so a couple more uh, things that tie into us. Uh, when you came here, you probably came down Barrel Road. Turns out Barrel Road was Barry O'Kelly's, Barrel, not Barrel Road, Barrel was Barry O'Kelly's daughter. Okay, she was born in the 20s. She just died in 2002. Uh, she got married, she left Method, uh, went to, um, got a master's degree from Columbia University and became a school principal in Long Beach, California. Okay, and that's her in the 60s. So she would have been in her 40s then. And that's the street you guys drove in on, is named for her. Um, 
this used to be Hillsborough Street, then it was old Hillsborough Street for a little while, and then it was Barrel, Barrel Road. Uh, if you guys come in the back way, you come in Ligon Street, uh, his wife, her maiden name was Ligon. Uh, it's named for her father, Lafayette Ligon. Um, and these street names luckily were preserved by the Method Civic community. That's another group of folks that live there who take on political um, uh, efforts today. Um, when Raleigh annexed Method and this land here in 1960 to put in the Beltline, uh, they changed all the road names. And Method Civic community said no way and they fought them and they won and otherwise this would, that would be, Method Road would be Kent Road. I don't know what Barrel Street would be, Old Hillsborough Street or something. Uh, I mentioned earlier a connection to Pullen. Um, so uh, there's no pictures of Pullen online. Pullen was this quirky guy, and he says, no one will ever get a picture of me. And my wife knows that, and she knows I hate being photographed. Uh, and so I had to just put a picture in of the park. Um, so Pullen was uh, another one of these land guys. Burial Kelly was a real estate guy buying and selling. So was Pullen. And Pullen lived um, uh, over in... in kind of near where Poland Park is now, there was a farm there. And uh, he inherited all his wealth from his rich aunt. Um, and then he used it to do philanthropy work and do real estate deals. Um, his connection to the university, other than just having Poland Park be nearby, is he donated the very first 62 acres that became the, um, the very Eastern, the oldest buildings on campus over there by the bell tower. And that was in the same year that he sold the land here to that group of people that included Barry O'Kelly and then eventually NC State again. How am I doing on time? It, do you want me to continue? Yes. Okay, okay, doesn't matter how I'm doing on time then, good. Uh, so I was gonna end here if we were late on time, but, um, but wait, there's more, okay? Um, so I'll go through this a little quicker so we can uh, be on our way. All right, I promised to mention the train tracks. Uh, and I had no idea people were so into trains. There's gigabytes of train information on the web. I had no idea. Uh, train nerds everywhere. And uh, so there's tons and tons of information. Who listens to the Midweek with Mark show every week, every Wednesday at 3? What happens at 3.05 that we have to pause for? <laughs> Right, the train goes by and we have to stop. I don't know why we don't start at 3.10 instead of three o'clock, but um, the train and, and that, that one thing, it got me thinking, oh, let's, let's look into the trains. Why are they there? They're in every map I ever looked at all the way back to the Civil War. So they predate the Civil War at least. Um, so the first, there's two, if you drive over the tracks, you go boom, 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 boom. There's two tracks that you go over. One of them was put in first. And that was for, um, in 1856, the uh, North Carolina Railroad was put in. And uh, it ran from Goldsboro to Raleigh and then to Charlotte in an arc. The highest point along this is High Point. Okay. <laughs> Just like the, neg the other railroad that went through the seaboard, the highest point in that is Apex. Yeah. Clever. So uh, it was later named the Southern Railroad and most of the information you'll find on it online is when it's called the Southern Railway. Um, and then I, uh, you can see Method is right there. Both tracks go right by here. This picture on the bottom is actually if you wanted to buy stock in the North Carolina Railway. I wouldn't do it now, it's not worth very much. <laughs> but um, you could, there's 10 shares right there. I can print one out for you. Um, so, uh, when the North Carolina Railway was being uh, built, before it was built, they did hyper-accurate surveys. Um, this was before there were deeds and platted surveys and anything. So they put out this book. It's actually three books. And each page is like a mile. And this is 100 feet wide. That was the, um, the boundary around the trail tra train track. And um, so I got onto the books and I went to Raleigh and followed Hillsborough Street West, and I kept turning pages. I finally found where Hillsborough Street jogged over the tracks, and that's where we are um, today. And so in 1850, we know that somebody named James Cook owned this property. I couldn't find anything about James Cook. He was long gone by the time the internet was invented. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so here's the second railroad. It's called the Seaboard Railroad. Anyone who eats at the fancy places downtown at Seaboard Station, Logan's Trading Company, that's that part. And they were they started off as the Raleigh and Gaston, uh, but then they were these railroads went out of business a lot, and they were sold and sold, resold and resold. And so by the time it came by us, it was the Seaboard uh, uh, Railway, which it stayed for a long time. All right, Camp Mangum, I'm going back to that story. So our deed, written in 1936, says something about started the trail, train tracks across from Camp Mangum. Camp Mangum was a Civil War uh, training ground for uh, Confederate troops, and is where all the uh, soldiers would come and be mustered and assigned to a regiment and then sent out. Um, Camp Mangum was pretty big. It, it's uh, incorporated... Um, all of uh, uh, the vet school, the fairgrounds. Uh, Meredith College wasn't there yet, so it was all of Meredith College, the art museum, and even, even more. I'm not quite sure how big it was, but it was pretty big. Um, and then in World War I, uh, that same land was used as, um, called Camp Polk, as a uh, tank training ground to train soldiers how to drive World War I era tanks. And so I, there are photos of that that I included here. Uh, of course, Camp Polk was followed by Polk Prison. Back then it was an adult male prison, it was a farm. And then that was followed by Polk Youth Prison, which was, when I moved to Raleigh in 76, that's what was along um, Blue Ridge Road was um, the youth prison. All right, so I promised that I'd talk about Burial Kelly's political activities. Um, so he um, was such a great leader of, of um, black people in Raleigh that he could muster any size vote he wanted to um, swing um, local politics uh, one way or another. And there, there's two times that came that were important to us. One is early on when he was working at the uh, general at the mercantile, um, he convinced somebody to put in a railroad spur. That's this third line. That comes off. Uh, if you if you came here from the Waffle House, bump 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 bump, um, and you you crossed over the seaboard and the and the um, and the Southern Railway, if you look to the right, it's barely there now. It's just a little disturbance in the grass. Goes almost into that tattoo shop. Um, <laughs> that's there. Um, there's the spur line. He used the spur line. They would um, he would. Uh, he became a wholesaler and he would have them park trains there so he could unload all this wholesale stuff that he, he would then resale. Um, so that was one thing he did was uh, get this spur line put in place. The other thing he did, which is real important to us, uh, happened during the 20s. During the 20s, there's this thing called the Great Road Movement. Uh, up until then, and of course nobody really had cars before then, up until then, the cities were paved and all the roads in between towns were dirt. And, um, and they would get rutted and muddy and almost impassable. And um, so in the 20s, there was this big thing all over the US, but especially in North Carolina, who tended to be behind the times and had particularly bad roads, um, to institute state highways and pave roads in between towns and this and that. So at that time, there was no Hillsborough Street beyond, Barrel Road was Hillsborough Street, okay? And um, the, the, city, the state and the city decided that they were gonna extend Hillsborough Street, make it perfectly straight, and they were just gonna cut this off and isolate method completely, okay? And so, uh, Barry O'Kelly uh, uh, got all his voters together and they um, uh, got the city and the state to agree to pay to pave Barrel Road and save it and keep method uh, connected to everything. Um, Few more bits of trivia here. Uh, okay, so here is, this is all NC State property before um, the Beltline went in. This was, this, this was the border of Raleigh up until 1960. Uh, it went up just north of Barrel, just north of the train tracks, and then curved and went up. It included what is now Meredith College, but nothing to the um, west of it. And then in 1960, um, uh, they annexed the era, area just so they could put in the Beltline. This, admittedly lousy photo, it shows the um, right-of-way for the, for the Beltline and how it cut off 
some of the land that we're on now and also some of um, Method Road or the, the Burial Kelly School was what mostly got it. And this is from 1970, back when the Beltline was still new. Bernadette told me that she used to like to play in the highway because no one, <laughs> no one was driving on it at first, kind of like 540 is now. Uh, and so she would run across the highway and she said there'd be many minutes in between cars coming. And so Bernadette, she can tell you all about it afterwards, what playing the street was like. But this is one of those high-res photos, and you can actually zoom in and get really close. Um, of course, here's the farm, there's the house, um, and here is the, um, uh, the O'Kelly School, and this greater bit is the Method community and the train tracks in Hillsborough Street. See almost, <laughs> almost. You can zoom into the point where you can see cars and they look, they're the size of an ant. Um, I, that is the photo I had up was pretty far zoomed in, but not all the way. <clears throat> uh, you can't quite see Bernadette then. <laughs> all right, so before 1936, there was still a horticultural experiment farm. It was actually located today, if any of you know NC State's campus, the H Hill Library, the Brickyard, um, all of that was trees and shrubs and fruit. That the same stuff that I mentioned earlier we were growing here, it's where they grew it there. They got sick of the students running over and picking all their fruit though. There's actually a funny story about a professor ordering one of his technicians to shoot the next student who came on. This is in the 20s and he did. He shot the poor kid in the head with a shotgun and gravely didn't kill him, but it hurt, okay? <laughs> Uh, and uh, Kilgore Hall is right about here. That's where any of us who had horticulture classes there, right? This is the old fairground before the new fairground, the current one, which was there from the 20s on. This was the old fairground, and this was a racetrack. Okay, this is the uh, rose, uh, the rose garden, and the um, the what's the little Raleigh Little Theater? That's right. That's that right there. That was that part of it was a racetrack. Um, and uh, this, this house, which is still there, this was the first, you know, how we had that house we tore down. The, the first house where they managed the farm is still there today. Um, and uh, I just zillowed it the other day, it's $650,000. So I'm not buying it anytime soon, but, uh, and it's, it's a pretty little house. Um, uh, Bernadette tells me that the fellow who owns Mitch's Tavern on Hillsborough Street, um, he and his family own that house now. So good for him. Uh, here's just some photographs. Here's a photograph and a plot of what that garden would have been. The thing that caught my eye and the one thing I would be interested in re reviving is there was a vineyard there. I would, that'd be cool to have Wolfpack wine, <laughs> trademark. Uh, and the last thing I'm gonna mention is uh, related to Barry O'Kelly again. Um, this is Barry O'Kelly, and this is a fellow named Julius Rosenwald. Anyone hurt here of Julius Rosenwald? Several of you have, good. Uh, Barry O'Kelly School did receive some funds from Julius Rosenwald. Julius Rosenwald was the president of Sears and Roebuck, who was the Amazon.com of the 1920s, okay? And uh, so he, he was a big philanthropist and was giving, his favorite thing to do was give money to um, uh, found fund or help fund um, schools for black children in the South. And he did 5,000 schools in the South. Um, now he didn't build the, pay for the whole thing. He would give them some startup money and then the community would give some money and, and so on. So um, the Barry O'Kelly School was going well by then, but um, he still took 3,000 bucks worth of Rosenwald's money to, and they built a, a dormitory. There was a dormitory at the Barry O'Kelly School for a while, a girl's dorm. All right, so that's enough trivia. I, I, I've taken you down several paths. I enjoyed, really enjoyed digging into this. I'm gonna go, I've already joined some old Raleigh Facebook groups and stuff so I can look at more old pictures. I'm gonna go home and do that right now. Thank you all for coming. All righty. So that was wonderful. Thank you, Dennis, for putting that together for us back in the good old days. It was really wonderful to revisit that. So we did have one question that came in from Marilyn. Marilyn's asking, why did the railroad build their rail line so that it crosses Old Hillsborough Road, Barrel Road, 
twice. That seems expensive and slow. There must have been some reason. Do you know, Dennis? I don't, but I have an idea. Um, the old Hillsboro Street, the um, it was a street that went out west out of Raleigh and went all the way to Cary. And actually, the then there was a right fork or a branch that went up to Durham and Hillsboro. Um, it was just a little dirt track. There was nothing to cross it. Railroads really need to follow the lay of the land. So they're not going up and down. There's a lot of energy involved with making a train go uphill. Uh, and so in all likelihood, they were following the lay of the land. And that meant they had to cross the old dirt paths that were in the way. And it wasn't, it wasn't anything to cross a dirt path. It was, there was no problem to do that. Sure. That makes sense. And I would like to remind you all that you are welcome to ask Dennis any questions if you have any. I have one question, Dennis. Was there anything while you were researching this that you found out about that you wish you were that you were able to put into the presentation? Or was there anything that you found out about the history of the land since doing this presentation that you wish you could have shared during that presentation? Uh, there was a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. Um, so I didn't talk much about the uh, cemetery. And Oak Grove Cemetery, which is at our back door. I see it every day. You guys um, on uh, Zoom land here probably don't see it that much. Uh, I drive by it every day. But before the Beltline was there, um, that was the cemetery for the Method community. And so you had Method Road going north to south. And this little road that would jog off of it, Ligon Street, uh, went to the cemetery. And um, there used to be a church there. Uh, and then there was, and they tore it down. And um, today, uh, there's only a handful of uh, gravestones left, but they did some uh, ground radar work when they were applying to be a, a National Register of Historic Places. And there's like 400 and something graves uh, in this little teeny tiny one acre ce cemetery. Um, yeah. Most of them are not marked, uh, and they only have a rough idea of who's in there. There are lists of people who are in interred in the cemetery and they, there's some O'Kellys and some Ligans and some of these other names that you see when you're driving around uh method. That okay. was, uh, yeah. that was some neat trivia that I didn't really talk too much about, you know, I ran out of For time. Sure. I had to cut. <laughs> yeah. Well, cemeteries are always just a, a wealth of local history and intrigue. So yeah, definitely. That's, that's yeah. really cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Marilyn's I, asking. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Blake. Well, I was going to say Marilyn's asking if there's a way to save or print all the links that Dennis put in the chat. And I will say, underneath the chat box, there is a little ellipses that you can click on. It says more, and if you click on that, there's a option to save the chat. And if you do that, you should be able to save a copy of the chat. Uh, if if that doesn't work for you, you can send me an email at rbwentel at ncsu.edu asking for the links. And I would be more than happy to share those with you. Yeah, these are all in a text file right now. We can just drop that into the comments of the uh, on YouTube. If Well, I guess if, if we post it, we can do that. Or post. you can just mail them the links directly. Yeah. Sure. And there's been more links that I didn't post. I was just it wasn't enough time even, uh, but I, there was so many, there's so much really cool historical information online. Uh, there are digital photo archives and there are PDFs, articles, histories. Um, people have scanned books that were written in the early 1900s and the late 1800s that talk about the history of like Wake County going back to, you know, uh, the, the Revolutionary War. And, and there's all kinds of really cool stuff that you don't even have to go to a library anymore and dig through the stacks. You can just find. It's just amazing. Definitely. I was really intrigued by those high resolution uh, aerial photos from like the 50s. Like it's really interesting that you can get all of that detail recorded on film, but then there was a period in time where the internet wasn't good enough to share it with people digitally, but now we can. You can see these really old pictures in just really crispy, glorious detail, which is actually, if you want to share my screen right now, I can show one and how yeah, far go you for can it. zoom in. Help yourself okay. by all means. Let's see that. I'll do that. I'm going to share my screen and let's see. I got to share the right one. All right. Are y'all seeing a blank screen right now? You are. Yes. We okay. see a blank desktop. So I did share the hyperlink right to these photos. I'm going to go ahead and pull up the 1959 photo. Yeah. And it's a, it's a TIFF, which is a, 
oh. a super high res, you know, lossless. Uh, no kidding. Up on my other screen. Hold on. Uh, a lossless uh, photo. But so this is the raw photo. And this we're talking about photo 7W71. And I included the hyperlink for to get to basically it take you to a map of Wake County. And then you have to zoom in and find where you're interested in. This little, uh, can you see my cursor moving across? Yeah, for screen? sure. We can see this it. road here, this zigzag one, that's Western Boulevard. And you can always find Western on these old photos because it's got this curious shape right near where we're at. Here are the train tracks right here. And here's Hillsborough Street coming like this. Okay. Uh, this is Meredith. Uh, and where's Blue Ridge Road? It's not really even there yet, is it? <laughs> uh, so let's zoom in. And this is one image. I'm just zooming in, rolling my mouse. And you can see I'm getting, this is the J.C. Ralston Arboretum property right here. And no this kidding. is the Method community right here. Uh, yeah. This is the Method School. And this is uh, what is um, now the Brookha Brickhaven building and the Beltline. But we can continue to zoom in really wow. close. I mean, yeah. And it's amazing, all the detail. Um, I have some old drawings from um uh from 1975 that talk a little bit about what those crops were there um and so this is the arboretum today this is barrel road this is the arboretum today roughly and when it first opened we didn't have that little sh um dog leg off to the south and so you can see outside of the arboretum 10 acres there was Pines and azaleas and blueberries, vegetables, apple orchard, um, a container nursery, peaches, grapes, other things. So um, that I spent the first part of the talk talking about what was going on on this property before the arboretum opened up. And so this kind of picture um, uh, gives you an idea of that. But then this, these photos really give you a good idea of the layout of those, um, of those uh, crops. They really do. And that's such a wonderful resource that's just available out in the public domain that anybody can look at and browse through at their. At yeah, their you can go um, find where your house is in Wake County. Uh, and yeah. uh, of course, a lot of those roads aren't there now. Um, so you're going to have to do some digging. I know I, my my uh, house where it is now, there was nothing there. It's just farm. So, uh, but yeah, you, you can sometimes find some really interesting things. Awesome. Well, I think that is all the questions that people have for us today. So, Dennis, thank you so much for pulling this lecture together for us in the first place. I will say I am not a history person whatsoever, but the way that you were able to like take genuine artifacts from the local area and make it relevant to like today to the things that are there here and now, that was that was really interesting, Dennis. So, that, so that's what you. really makes history interesting for me is to what what's the connection to to the story to this, absolutely to this place to me to you to the um a certain building that you or a road you drive on or whatever um, absolutely those, those and, connections and those stories really bring history alive sure and so much of history is just history for history's sake so thank you so much dennis for not doing that for actually connecting it to us and what we're doing here and now it was incredibly interesting and thank you so much, everybody, for joining us for this replay. We greatly appreciate all of you coming out for this. Like I said, the original intention was not to post this online, but there does seem to be a fair amount of demand for it. So I will dis discuss things with the education team, and we will see what we decide on for that. I hope you all will come and join us next week for the midweek program on Wednesday at three o'clock. Next week will be intern takeover. So our horticulture summer interns, I have no idea what they're going to do. They are plotting as we speak to make next week's midweek the most fun and enjoyable one that there has ever been. So you all they, go and make sure they are you free. Can. They're freaking out a little bit right now because they're like, I have to be on TV next week. I have to pick some wow. plants that I want to talk about. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. They, this happens every summer and they they always find something really cool and interesting. Yeah, they do. And they're going to be phenomenal no matter what happens. It's going to be a lot of fun. So I, I cordially invite all of you to join us for that next week. It's going to be great. And yeah, we'll see you all then. Y'all take care.